Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Stuff Look Good in Unity. Like many others, I've been obsessed with Overwatch. I've always been a fan of Blizzard games, but damn did they ever outdo themselves with this game. It's filled with impressive visual effects that I'd love to break down and recreate, so don't be surprised if I come up with more Overwatch case studies in the future. For today, we're just going to tackle one effect, Winston's Barrier Projector. I chose this effect to study because it does some cool stuff with the depth buffer that I haven't explored in other videos. Also for those wondering, this is more or less the same effect as Reinhardt's Barrier, so you'll be able to recreate that after this video as well. Okay, let's break down this effect and get to it. Starting with the obvious, the barrier is basically just a big translucent sphere. It's got a white glowing edge anywhere where it intersects with OPEG geometry. A ring of hexagons cascades down from the top of the barrier and fades towards the center. If we place the barrier like this, we can see that there's actually rings emanating from both poles and converging in the center. Also from this view, we can see that the northern pole is glowing. Next up, we've got the outer rim. A little rim lighting calculation keeps the edge of the barrier visible even when it isn't overlapping level geometry. And then maybe the most subtle feature of the barrier, the rim doesn't just add a glowing edge, it also makes a pulsing hex pattern visible. This is especially noticeable when you're passing through the barrier with the character pointed perpendicular to the surface of the sphere. So in total we've got the surface color, depth based intersections glow, cascading rings from either pole, the north pole glow, the outer rim glow, and the pulsing hexes along the rim. Okay, before we get to shadering, we need a piece of geometry to stick the shader onto. We want a sphere, but the default sphere from Unity is kind of goofy and doesn't really unwrap UVs the way we want it to. So I just grabbed a simple sphere from 3D's Max to use instead. Now onto our shader. In a default unlit shader, we'll start with the surface color and build up from there. One of the first decisions we need to make is how we'll do blending. You can quickly convince yourself that additive is the right choice for a couple of reasons. First of all, we know backface culling will be disabled because we can see through to the other side of the barrier as well we can see the cascading hexes in the surface color when we're standing inside the bubble. Alpha blended geometry doesn't really work well with cull off unless somehow we guarantee triangles were drawn from back to front. The other way we can quickly test that the barrier should be additively blended is by dropping it in front of a white skybox and it basically becomes invisible. So now that alpha isn't going to be used for blending, I'll use it to control the contribution of the flat surface color. Now let's get to the really juicy part of the effect, the intersections. To create these dynamic edges, we'll need access to the scene's depth. We can enable the camera to write the scene depth, and theoretically we can do this at no extra cost if we're using the deferred render path, because it needs the depth and normal buffers for lighting calculations anyway. So we'll switch the main camera to be deferred. This depth texture is accessible in the shader as the camera depth normals texture. So now we'll need our vertex shader to give us some more information to work with. We'll need the screen space UV position to sample the depth texture with. We'll also need the depth of the fragment itself. Note that I had to flip my screen UV coordinate. This seems to be different on deferred and forward rendering. I'm not sure about the platform specificity of the depth textures orientation. So your mileage may vary. Now we've got all the data we need to generate some depth effects. First, we need to decode the screen depth as a float. Then we can take the difference between the screen depth and the fragment depth. This difference value is relative to the camera's far clipping plane, so we'll smooth step the value between 0 and projection params.w, which is just equal to 1 over the far plane value. So now we've got a value between 0 and 1 that is independent of the far plane settings. If we take 1 minus intersect, we'll get a value close to 1 where the screen and fragment depths are similar that fades to 0 as the depth values diverge. I also added a branch here to avoid generating any edges behind objects, otherwise we might see some ugly white lines when an object is sitting in front of the barrier. We can just add the intersect value to our flat color to get a white edge anywhere where the sphere overlaps any Z writing geometry. To make those intersections look more like they do in Overwatch, we can first tighten up the edge by multiplying our projection params by something smaller like 0.5. The other thing we can do is produce a nicer color to use. For my edge color, I lurk between the selected color and white, exponentiating the intersect value to make the white edge sharper, with a longer tail of blue fade. Okay, next let's do the moving hexagon rings. We'll need a tileable texture, something that looks like this. In a vertex shader, we'll use the built-in transform text function when passing the UVs along. This just allows us to use the built-in tiling properties on the material editor. Essentially, we just want to add the sampled value, multiplied by our main color, to the return value but then we want to modulate this value over time relative to the object space Y value of the fragment. So we'll have our vertex shader pass the object position along as well. Then all we need is some repeating wave function based on time. 
After a lot of tweaking, I came up with this triangle wave pattern that uses some clamping and all kinds of magic numbers. This was all just an effort to have relatively sharp peaks of the wave with some breaks in between, and it's pretty janky looking. This gives us a hex pattern that rains down the sphere, but remember we want to have the wave emanate from the poles and fade in the center. We're using the object Y position in our wave function, which for the sphere is 0.5 at the top and negative 0.5 at the bottom. We can take the absolute values and multiply by 2 to get a normalized Y distance from the center. Using that in our wave function gives us a hexagon pattern radiating out of each pole and converging at the equator. Okay, it's looking pretty good so far. Next up is the rim color. This is more or less the same technique we used to create the character outlines in my Stealth Games case study, so I'm not going to get into it again here. You can check out that video or just look up rim lighting. Because we're already making a nice color for our intersections, we can actually just get more use out of that lerp function by subbing a value named glow in for the exponentiated intersect value, where glow is the max value between the rim lighting calculation and the intersection. Similarly, we can piggyback the north pole's glow into the equation. To get a value for the north pole, we can use our object space y position again. We know the y position at the top of the sphere is 0.5, so we can just do some simple math based around that to get values near the top of the sphere that produce a nice glow. Okay, just one last feature of the effect left to cover, the subtle pulsing hexes along the rim. Note that they are just at the rim and not in other glowing areas like the intersections. For this part of the effect, I created a texture that looks like this. The plan being to fade these inner glowing hexes in and out with a sine wave. This actually looks alright, but all the hexes being in sync makes the repetition very obvious, and there are times where there are no hexes visible at all, which we don't want. So in addition to the glowing texture, we'll take another texture like this, and we'll use the sampled value from it to phase shift the sine wave, giving us pulsing hexes that are out of sync. To make the pulsing hexes only visible near the edge of the barrier, we can just multiply the sample value by our rim calculation from earlier. At this point in our shader, we've got three texture samples, but because they're all grayscale textures, we may as well pack them all into the RGB channels of a single texture and save two unnecessary texture samples. And with that, our barrier shader is pretty much complete. You can change the color to orange to get the opposing team variant, or any other color you like, whatever. As usual, the shader and other assets used in the video are available in the download link below. Before I sign off, I'll mention that I've left out the visual impact of bullets hitting the barrier. This is part of a screen space distortion effect that appears all over the place in Overwatch, and it's a big enough of a topic to merit a video of its own. Like I said, the game is filled with impressive visual effects, so there's more than a couple reasons to revisit it in later videos. Shout out to my patrons on Patreon, thank you for keeping the dream alive. And as always, thank you all for watching, keep on making those video games.